as, as, as Steve has told us, um, uh, liberal democracy is, is, is not dead, but uh, it, it's, it's, it's not doing very well uh, either, um, and, and it's failing. And I, I'm an economist, and it's not at all clear what an economist can, uh, can, uh, can say about this. Um, there's an old joke that an economist, uh, the definition of an economist is somebody who, who sees something uh, work in practice and asks if it can also work in theory. Um, uh, it, it turns out that, that um, uh, this particular role of an economist can sometimes be useful. Um, and, and I want to approach uh, my subject um, somewhat uh, in, in, that, uh, in that light. And, and rather than um, focus on why is it that liberal democracies are failing, I want to ask the question, why should they exist in the first place? Um, and the idea is that if we can understand uh, a little bit better what are the conditions uh, under which we can actually um, have uh, liberal democracy. Um, we might also have a better idea about um, what are the conditions under which they can be sustained, and more importantly, what are the conditions under which uh, they, uh, they end up failing. Um, so that might provide us uh, with a kind of a window on, on the uh, fragility of liberal democracy and, and, and the particular challenge uh, that, that we face today. Um, let me uh, begin by making a, a distinction that is going to be, I think is an important practical distinction, is also going to be important to the uh, comments that I'm going to make. Um, and and um, there are very different types of, of democracies, and I want to distinguish in, in, in particular between what more one might call a, uh, an electoral democracy and a liberal democracy. And our focus here in is in particular on liberal democracy, but we want to understand that liberal democracy is part of a, of a larger group, uh, of a larger concept of democracy. So very, very crudely put, uh, an electoral democracy is a democracy where people get to vote every four or five uh, years, and they get to choose their leaders and their, and their party. Uh, but once in, their, once in power, whoever gets elected can, is pretty much free to do whatever they want, um, except for uh, prevent another election. Um, uh, a liberal democracy is, is different, um, and I think when we talk about the failure of democracy, uh, that's the kind of democracy that we have in mind. A liberal democracy is an electoral democracy plus something else. And what that something else is, uh, is that um, the leaders in power, uh, either institutionally or legally, or through the kind of norms that uh, Steve talked about, are prevented from engaging in, uh, in actions that uh, discriminate uh, um, uh, and in particular violate the rights of uh, minority groups. And that, those might, minority groups might be uh, um, ethnic, religious minorities, or they could be ideological minorities, people that who simply think differently. So in a liberal democracy, therefore, there are explicit um, constraints on what the executive can do. Uh, and those constraints come in the form of separation of powers, uh, they come in the form of an independent judiciary. They come in the form of a, of a free media where everybody is, is able to um, uh, speak their minds without fear of, of persecution. Um, and I think what um, uh, Steve and Dan uh, have done very nicely in their last, latest book uh, is, is, is underscored the extent to which uh, these constraints, the constraints on what the executive can do to others in particular, um, to uh, um, specific minorities um, uh, are uh, held up not just by constitutional or, or, or legal strictures, but actually sort of prevailing norms um, that they call uh, mutual tolerance or, 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 or institutional uh, uh, for forbearance. Now, um, is this, does this thing, is this an important distinction and can you actually maintain electoral democracy for a long time um, uh, um, without it turning necessarily into a dictatorship? I think that's an open question, but I think when you look at you know, a country like um, Hungary today, um, we can all agree that uh, this is not a liberal democracy. On the other hand, um, the party in power has won handily in an election. And I, you know, it, it's, you know, it's, 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 uh, it, that was um, an electoral test. Uh, there was a democratic test that, that they passed. So we might be very well 
um, it, it might make a lot of sense to call Hungary an electoral democracy, but not, uh, in fact, a, a, a liberal democracy. Uh, there are some people who, um, uh, uh, like uh, Jan Werner Müller in particular, who has argued that, that we should not gratify uh, or reward countries like uh, Turkey or, or Hungary with the term democracy of any kind, uh, because uh, essentially those countries do not accord uh, with our conceptions of what a liberal democracy um, ought to look like with all those constraints and civil liberties um, and restraints that, that I've mentioned about. But I think that, that sort of confuses the normative and the positive, that you know, one doesn't necessarily have to take the view that uh, just by calling it a regime democracy, um, that we're necessarily um, you know, sort of exalting it in a particular way. Um, uh, the, um, so I, will, I, will, uh, I think that that distinction is, is a useful one. Now, um, why have I made this distinction and why is it important? Um, well, first of all, to underscore that what we really care about uh, is, is when we worry about what's happening today is sort of the, the decline of, of norms of liberal democracy as opposed to electoral democracy per se. Uh, but also sort of to go back to my starting question about you know, why should liberal democracy exist in the first place, if we look in to the uh, theories about why democracy uh, emerges in the first place. Uh, it turns out that they're really all theories about electoral democracy of one kind or another, and we actually don't have any good theories about why liberal democracy uh, emerges uh, uh, in particular. So to, to, you know, to summarize and caricature very broadly, I think there are two types of theories about how and why democracy emerges. Uh, one theory is basically largely based on theories of uh, sort of uh, social class and, and, and mass mobilization from below. So the story is that you have a, uh, an autocratic elite uh, who has held on to power for a very long time, but then because of economic changes, industrialization, urbanization, there is sort of mass mobilization of a labor movement uh, that militates and they want to share in power. And uh, then, um, then you get a, a kind of a bargain that says that the elite provide um, these masses with the right to vote uh, in return for the masses and or the parties representing the masses uh, some kind of, of protection of their property rights so that, that you know, once the, uh, the majority or the masses have their parties that they're not going to expropriate the elite. And that's sort of loosely speaking the history of the sort of very highly stylized history of how uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, electoral democracy uh, arises uh, in, the, in, in Britain with the mass industrialization, the mass labor movement, and, and so forth. So that's sort of one story about how democracy arises that, um, that is a story about um, mobilization from below and the elites having to sort of compromise uh, with, the, uh, with, the, uh, with the masses. There's another second class of explanations that has to do with um, uh, uh, not the um, uh, masses, but in terms of um, uh, intra-elite conflicts, that there are different groups of elites, and, uh, and they're sort of, you know, they're e roughly equally balanced, so that one cannot necessarily uh, repress the other uh, without significant amount of cost, and therefore they reach a kind of a, of a bargain uh, that uh, essentially different elite groups, or, you know, the sort of, if you want to think concretely about um, a, an, an established elite group, an established landed group versus a, a newly rising mercantile or mercantile group uh, that they, uh, they reach an implicit bargain uh, that uh, they commit not to expropriate e each other uh, by providing for an alternation in power through elections. And what, uh, what enables the development of these norms of toleration or, 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 or forbearance is that uh, that, that no group really wants to expropriate the other because they know that they might in turn be replaced in some future election by the other vote. So you don't want to be, uh, you want to be ni nice enough to the other guy that when they come, then the other guy comes into power that they'll have the incentive to be in turn nice to you. Um, now, so that's going to, uh, to the extent that sort of property rights are, are best provided under some kind of a, you know, a, a democ democratic regime, uh, then that's also going to yield um, uh, sort of a kind of a democratic settlement. Uh, but what's, what's important about both types of stories, whether democ democracy comes about 
because of this uh, conflict between the elites and the rest of society or co comes up uh, because of, of different of conflict among elite groups. In both cases, uh, the democratic settlement uh, essentially is going to leave out uh, the group that liberal democracy or the groups that liberal democracy aims to protect. Uh, and those are uh, the various ideological, ethnic, religious uh, uh, kind of minorities, so that the protection of minority rights, the civil liberties, um, and the restraints uh, from whom uh, uh, um, uh, the, the minority groups in particular uh, benefit from, uh, they're not going to be, the groups that are benefit from that are not going to be in, in, in a sitting in the, in the bargaining table. Um, so uh, it is not, therefore, surprising that, that um, we are not going to have, uh, necessarily, as part of the equilibrium that generates democracies, we're not going to have a strong political support for institutions that essentially have with the liberal element of, of, of liberal democracy, such as judicial independence, freedom of the media, uh, civil liberties uh, more broadly. Uh, so the point of this is to, to, to underscore that that liberal democracy does not arise naturally um, in our sort of standard explanations for how democratic transitions uh, actually happen. Um, so how does it actually arise? Um, how did the West get it? Um, well, there are sort of you know, different kind of stories. Um, in Britain, for example, um, uh, and to some extent in the United States also, I think what played a key role was that uh, historically liberalism uh, preceded mass franchise. That is that, that the norms of liberalism had uh, been adopted before um, the elections um, uh, were, became part of the system. So Britain was a liberal autocracy before it became uh, a democracy. In fact, the liberals, for the liberals, it was a compromise. It was sort of, you know, that the liberals don't, didn't really want elections because they worried, for example, as, as uh, the Tocqueville worried about the United States, about the tyranny of the majority. Uh, even John Stuart Mill um, thought that sort of, you know, elections were suited only for sort of advanced societies, that, that for example, that it wasn't suitable for Russia or for that matter, India, uh, because those weren't civilized societies that they couldn't, you couldn't trust people with the vote. Um, and um, so these were the kinds of worries that, that liberals had uh, about the, the expansion of the manch -Freisar. So in a ways, so liberal, the, the, you know, the, uh, the electoral dimension or the, the, um, the, the franchise um, came uh, as, as, as part of liberals conceding uh, the role for, for, for elections. And so what that means is that in, in those kinds, of, in this, in those kinds of, of settings in the West, uh, the pre-existence of uh, uh, liberal norms uh, made the transition to French fr mass franchise uh, somewhat um, more uh, robust in terms of, of, of the, the, the continuation of, of those liberal norms. Um, when you look at sort of you know, the other parts of the world, such as newly independent countries uh, uh, you know, decolonizing um, in, 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 the, in, the, in the late 50s and 1960s, in fact, the, the conditions were there very highly unfavorable to, uh, to liberal uh, democracy because there you did not have a pre-existing uh, liberal tradition. And the kind of, of social mobilization that happened uh, and that led to democratic movements in places like Asia or, 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 or Africa uh, took place in the context of wars of national liberation or wars of independence. And those were uh, essentially based uh, uh, on uh, specific identities, uh, emphasizing national, ethnic, or sectarian aspects of these societies, uh, as opposed to the kind of social class, uh, labor movement uh, type of, of, of uh, transition that we had um, in the West and in Britain in particular. And I think sort of all the exceptions uh, of uh, transitions to liberal democracy that proved sort of quasi-lasting uh, in the developing world uh, are actually pretty much confirm uh, that, uh, that, that rule. Uh, that in some sense, if you think about countries that have um, been the most sort of successful long-term transition to liberal democracy uh, in, devo in, in developing countries, 
Uh, they're actually hard to think of, 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 of many sort of liberal democracies per se. Uh, one of the ones that come to mind is South Korea, which had a very successful transition in the late 1980s. Uh, in many ways, sort of the, the South Korean experience seems a little bit like uh, a sort of a, uh, the kind of the British transition that was telescoped uh, in time. Uh, it, was, it was led uh, from below by a, a working class as a consequence of rapid industrialization allied with, with the student movement. Um, and, and perhaps the reason that the South Korean liberal democracy has, provide, has, has, has uh, been more so durable at least to date, it may have to do something with the ethnic hom homogeneity of South Korean society, that, that there are sort of alternative ethnic or racial cleavages are much, uh, are, are, uh, that, that could, um, that their exploitation of which could undermine liberal democracy uh, for in, a, in a majoritarian direction um, have, been, um, have been less, um, uh, uh, less prevalent. Um, uh, the, um, the South African case is interesting because uh, here is a case where, uh, again, the transition was a little bit like uh, sort of the, the, the Western model I described, again, sort of a, 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 an entrenched elite uh, negotiating with a, a mass movement. Um, and the transition takes place in 1994. And what's very interesting in the South African transition is that um, Unlike most such transitions, the elite in South Africa was interested not only in protecting their own property rights, but there also was, because they were also a racial minority, they were interested in protecting civil liberties as well. Um, and therefore, sort of a, the, the civil liberties dimension of, of the democratic transition, the Bill of Rights, was especially prominent in the, um, in the, in the democratic transition in, uh, in, in, in South Africa. But of course, the South African story sadly also shows the, 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 the nature of this, of the obsolescing bargain, uh, that it's hard to maintain these bargains over time once the uh, minority rights gave up uh, power. Uh, then it, you know, sort of there was a tendency of the, the South African liberal regime uh, to, um, to, 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 uh, to experience an erosion uh, of, those, of those civil rights and liberties um, and, and, a, and a drift towards uh, a majoritarian uh, electoral democracy, uh, which uh, perhaps has now been partially reversed with, with recent developments there, one, one would hope. Um, so let's sort of, if I return to, to the advanced developing countries where sort of the context in which we worry about um, the failures of liberal democracy, what, what does this story suggest? Um, what it suggests is that, that what we think about as an exception, some, you know, a failure or undermining, maybe really maybe a return to a more normal equilibrium. That is that what's really abnormal has been the maintenance. Uh, of these liberal democracies in the West for a certain period of time, and that what we may have taken for granted may in fact not be the normal state uh, of, of, of things, um, that there were very specific um, things having to do with the very specific historical context in which the initial transitions occurred, uh, the very specific post-war context that helped um, uh, liberal democracy in, in Western Europe, uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the failures of, of alternative modes of, of governance, the fascism and Nazism and, 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 and communism, that for a while upheld uh, these, these liberal norms, uh, but that uh, given the underlying fragility uh, of, of liberal democracies in equilibrium, that we maybe we should not be surprised that, that we cannot really uh, sustain uh, the, the, uh, this, this, out, this outcome for a long time. Now, so the, the question that, that I want to end up with is, is the question sort of is, is, is have we really come then to the end of this road? Is there nothing that can be done? Uh, or is there anything that can be done? And here I want to um, uh, suggest that uh, something that may seem a little bit paradoxical, that in fact, um, in light of the problems of polarization and, and populism that, that Steve uh, described, um, that part of the solution uh, to the rise of, of populism uh, may very well be a kind of um, a, a uh, an economic populism might be one way to actually um, to to save uh, the the political system. So I I, I I make a distinction here between the political elements of of of, of populism, which uh, is what my focus has been, which is really the harmful part of populism, which is a 
a rejection of any kind of restraint on the use of executive power. Um, now, there is, there is the, the economic dimension of populism. It's at some level conceptually similar because e economic populists uh, also reject any restraints on the use of executive power for uh, th in the conduct of economic policy. So they tend to like independent regulatory agencies. They tend to like independent central bank. They, then, they tend to like delegation to international trade agreements or international agencies. Uh, and, and when Latin Americans uh, in this room uh, think about uh, economic populism, of course, in Latin America, they're immediately thinking of, of country, of, of, of governments that don't, uh, that, you know, with a completely discretionary way, uh, expand on uh, monetary and fiscal policy and, 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 and run very high inflation. But of course, that's not the only way that economic populism uh, can be, uh, can, can, uh, can exhibit itself. Another type of economic populism is uh, I think the, 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 the nicest historical analogy is, is the New Deal in the United States. Um, and in fact, the New, New Deal um, during uh, the Great Depression uh, took place at a historical uh, juncture where the challenges were, um, many, were really quite similar. And there were lots of uh, political populists in the background, uh, nativists, um, and demagogues, um, uh, you know, whom uh, FDR was really trying to, um, to, um, uh, uh, to, to overcome. Um, and, and at the time, of course, the New Deal was, was you know, viewed as something that because it, it, it upset so many economic orthodoxies, such as the limited role of the state in economics or the, the sanctity of the gold standard, uh, that it was viewed as something that was very, very dangerous. But of course, we know with historical hindsight that the new institutional innovations um, uh, that the New Deal undertook, um, although very, very sort of you know viewed as very negative by the uh, economic elite at the time, uh, um, you know set the stage for uh, a, a new kind of a, of a market economy that that was much more inclusive, and provided for much greater. Um, uh, a potential for economic growth. Um, I think so there's a version of this um, that I think might very well be required these days that, that uh, in some sense um, uh, tries to uh, get at the failings of our current versions of our liberal democracies um, and uh, does so by um, targeting the inordinate po power of, of uh, financial interests, uh, financial institutions, um, tries to uh, increase actually the economic policy space for, for governments so that they can uh, pr uh, uh, pursue more inclusive uh, uh, policies. Um, and and uh, you know, sort of you know, goes back to trying to respond to some of the majoritarian demands uh, that uh, today's liberal democracy um, has been unable to, to respond to because of um, a sort of a, a rather narrow conception of economic policy and what uh, governments could do in the, in the, in the economic uh, uh, domain. And I think what has happened, and I think one of the, the sort of you know, a key f you know, reason that this polarization has taken place and populism uh, has, has, um, has, has won ground um, ha is related to the particular failures of the established uh, establishment and the, and the of both the center right and the center left to respond to some of these uh, majoritarian uh, demands um, and you know sort of you know there's, there's, there's a, a, a new book that, that Bob Kuttner has come out with where he discusses sort of you know how the Demo in, you know, so the Democratic Party in particular has pursued uh, a, a kind of, of policy that that has left uh, has not been unable has not been able to uh, to formulate an adequate response as he says the only thing missing in Hillary Clinton's platform was social class that is that there were all sort of different uh, identity groups uh, to, w to whom a certain kind of social liberalism uh, was the response. Um, so if, you know, to, if, if to me, if, if liberal democracy today is to succeed, it will have to sh show that it works for the majority too, um, that it is not a form of special interest uh, politics uh, supported by financial elites on the one hand and very specific identity groups on the other. Uh, and I think it's, it's ex 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 exactly this kind of failure uh, that the populists um, have, have exploited. So 
in a way, I think, somewhat paradoxically, I would argue that a certain degree of economic pop uh, populism is needed uh, precisely to save uh, liberal democracy from the really harmful kind of popula uh, populism, which is the political populism that undermines uh, these liberal norms. Thank you. Thank you.